I'd like to welcome you to Resurrection Sunday celebration with the North Carolina National Guard Chaplain Corps. It is a joy for us to come together, even if it is in this fashion, in a virtual format. I hope you take time to pause with us for a moment to celebrate, uh, as we do, and we look to the Word of God in just a few moments uh, and see the hope and the life that we celebrate in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I look forward to having with us this, this celebration day uh, Staff Sergeant Tarvik Linder, who will be uh, reading the Word of God for us, and then Chaplain Major Thomas Watson, who will be bringing our message uh, this morning uh, for Resurrection Sunday. And again, I want to open us in prayer and thank you for taking time to join us with the North Carolina National Guard Chapel. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your goodness. We're very thankful that uh, we can come together to, uh, to pray, to worship, to spend time around your word. And even from a distance, we have a platform, a forum like this, where we can uh, come together to worship in this way. It's a virtual format, but yet, Lord, this is something that you've established and allowed for us to utilize in this way. We don't feel so alone. We don't feel so isolated. We can come and we can partner with others of like faith and be encouraged in our celebration of life, life that came as a result of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So we thank you that we can do that this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would be glorified and that you would be exalted in this time together. Bless Chaplain Watson as he delivers the Word of God. Father, we pray that you continue to be with the many that are working right now diligently and tirelessly in response to COVID-19. And Father, we have a number of folks with state active duty working for our North Carolina National Guard, our soldiers and our airmen serving. Uh, throughout our state and, Father, throughout the uh, country, we have many National Guard uh, members that have responded and emergency workers, the Department of Health and Human Services, all working in partnership. And we pray your blessings upon them, your protection, and your wisdom that they need uh, to continue the work in the ministry that they're doing for on behalf of the citizens and the communities throughout our state and throughout our country. And we'll give you praise. Bless this celebration, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the two men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sergeant Linder, Chaplain Heitman. What a glorious occasion it is to celebrate Easter. And I want you to know this morning that the current COVID crisis that we're in will not stop Easter from happening. It won't stop you from celebrating the beauty that came out of it, of a resurrection that has set us free as a people of God. I want to continue on the scriptures and what was read to you. I want to give you a message of hope and healing this morning. I want you to see that navigating crisis is possible as a Christ follower. So how do we do that? 
I want to give you four truths of navigating crisis as a Christ follower. What you got to understand is Jesus brought in a paradigm shift. He had a new way of looking at things. He looked at the world. He taught differently. He taught with authority as in if he had something at stake in his very teaching. He also turned a sterile religion into a personal relationship. That's one reason why he was hated by many, but also loved by many. So number one, how do you navigate crisis as a Christ follower? Crisis is an opportunity to show our faith, not hide it. Crisis is an opportunity to show our faith, not hide it. Look, people go to church when things are going great. Have you ever noticed it? Everything's sunny, bright. They're at church. But when people stop showing up, I've learned to take notice because there's probably something happening in their lives. There's probably some crisis, something at stake that has pulled them away. And you know what we do as humans? We want to save face. We don't want to admit it at first. But it's usually these same people who show up on the counseling phone call later. So, I want you to see these women that went to the tomb. They didn't fall into that trap. They were true to their faith and their understanding of Jesus, although they didn't realize everything that was happening, but they saw this crisis as an opportunity to show their faith. You see, it says they got up that early Sunday morning. Do you get up early any morning? Sometimes it's hard for me. But these women, it said they got up very early Sunday morning to go to the tomb. Now, why would they do that? Jesus was killed before their very eyes. Their hopes were dashed of a, of, a, of a Savior who would come and liberate the people from Roman oppression. But they had in their minds they were going to go to the tomb. They weren't prevented by other circumstances such as an earthquake or seeing strange people they didn't understand, but they continued the mission. You see, when we're strong in our faith, we're able to stand firm and continue the mission that God has given us and that includes the mission that we have as soldiers to care for our country, our community, our people. When adversity comes, crisis comes, people hide. As people of the uniform, we don't do that. We do the opposite. When crisis comes, we suit up and we run in to save the day. But spiritually, what do you do when crisis comes? Do you shut down? Do you think that God has left you? That God forgot about you? He hasn't. When devastation comes to your door, will you still believe the truth that has been setting you free? The best thing you can do in a bad situation is to be present for somebody else. And I believe that's what these women did. They said, we're going to get up and we're going to go down there and we're going to, they were going to honor the dead. They took the spices that they had. They were planning to put these on Jesus' body. Then they got down there. Something different had happened. But they still showed their opportunity, or they came with an opportunity to show their faith. And many, many, many years later, we're reading about the display of their faith because they got up early that Sunday morning. It's interesting to note that they got up early Sunday morning because they could have gone the day before, but it was the day of Sabbath, the day of rest. They were still practicing in their, their, their faith. They were still abiding by what they to do. Number two, how do we navigate crisis as a Christ follower? Crisis can be paralyzing until you start Crisis brings more questions than answers, but that's okay. Because if we're pondering the crisis, we're analyzing the conditions, then we're still in the game. We're still in play. Did you know that we have a divine connection? I want to I give you some examples in the Bible. Engineers, you probably think you wrote the blueprint for it all. and You, you guys are great, but God created the first blueprint. He was the first engineer. If we go back and look at the scriptures, look at history, the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve a structure, a blueprint, but they filled up the garden. 
Joseph was called to save Egypt through his intellect that ultimately came from God. The Tower of Babel, they were doing so well and being so creative that God said we need to confuse them and cause them to scatter. How about Noah's Ark? Where did he get instruction to build such a structure? Ephesians 2.12 says that we are God's masterpiece. We are created to do good, to create as God creates. So that's why we don't get paralyzed. Instead, we analyze what's going on. So the women, it says, they had found that the stone was rolled away from the entrance. You know what? If I were going somewhere, especially to a, a cemetery, and an earthquake came, I think I'd have gone back home. But these women, know they weren't going to be deterred. Instead, they went inside this tomb where the stone was rolled away. Uh, clue number two, that stone was too heavy. It should have been in place. It says they went in and still did not find the body of Jesus. I applaud these women. These women are strong. They're courageous. Don't know if I would have stayed long enough. But there was something inside of them that says, no, we're going to analyze this situation. There's something here we need to learn. Number three, how do we navigate crisis as a Christ follower? Crisis becomes a catalyst to elevate our faith. However, I will say this, you have to stay in the fight to understand what that means. How can we elevate our faith through a crisis, seemingly? If you look at if the, these, these women again, it says they stood there puzzled, and there were two men that suddenly appeared. Strangely enough, they were clothed in dazzling robes. One of the other scriptures says their faces were like lightning Look, again, look, some superhero from another world showed up. I'm probably gone. Man, I'm probably out of there. These women stayed. So, how did their faith get elevated? So, here, here's, a, here's another hint. When crisis comes to a true follower of Christ, we will be humbled, not horrified. See, God calls us to stay in to learn about something he wants to teach us, something that's going to grow us. A few years ago in my first ministry, we had, um, we had Bible study on Wednesday nights at my house. And it got to the point where we had a lot of people uh, coming in. We had uh, probably a living room full of 30 plus people. On this particular night, there was a young lady that came for the first time. And she asked that we would go and pray over her. So we took her in the kitchen and me and my wife began to pray over her. And some things happened. I'm just going to tell you. Some things happened in that moment that would scare most people to death. And as it was happening, I actually had a thought that I should run out of here. I should be driven. But a strength came upon me. I can't explain it. But it, it was, I know it's from God. And I, and I knew I was supposed to be there and to keep praying. But this young lady there was a demonic possession going on and it was displaying itself in my very kitchen. And, and, and again, I can't tell you everything else that was going on. I felt like I was in a bubble. But there was one thing that I knew that God wanted me to stay in that crisis and see it through. He didn't want me to leave. As a matter of fact, I couldn't. I felt such a bond and such a strength. All I wanted to do was stay there and pray. James talks about how we grow in our faith and our character through adversity. It's, it's the bad things. It's when stuff just goes wrong that we can't control. That's the growth moments for us as children of God. So if crisis has you running too long, too far, you might want to check your salvation. Because if you belong to God, you can't run too far and too long before you turn, God turns that into a teaching moment. Let's look at these women. Again, it says, then the men asked, those strange men, by the way, why are you looking for the dead among the living? I want to ask you the same question this morning. Why do you keep looking in the past instead of the future? We know the one who holds the future, who can tell us what's going to happen tomorrow, but sometimes we'd rather look at the dead relationships that we have. Or we'd rather go back to the addictive 
things of life. Or we would go back and, and, and rely on our pocketbook, what's in our bank account or not in our bank account, as to how we're going to feel the next day. You see, it's moment after moment I have to catch myself from trying to live in the past when God is saying He wants us to live for the future. So dead relationships, dead-end jobs, self-doubt, that's a thing of the past. That's a thing that's in the death of the past. So what do you do to keep from the pain of the past? What do you do to keep yourself looking to the future? I remember when I was, uh, I, w I was about 22 years old, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a season in my life in high school where this young girl really liked me. But I had a girlfriend, I didn't give her any attention. This went on for about a year. So we went our separate ways. Five years later, uh, my girlfriend broke up with me. So I had this bright idea that I was just going to get on the phone and call this girl from five years ago who liked me so much. And maybe we could strike up a conversation and maybe something else. Well, me and my thinking, I get on the phone, I'm ready for her to answer. She's gonna answer in a sweet voice. It's gonna be pleasant, it's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be a reconnection, a reunion. But no, that's not what happened, I was shocked. She actually got on the phone and she almost screamed, why are you calling me? I didn't know what to say. In my head, I thought I was something. I remembered from the past how great she thought I was. Not so now. How is it with your spiritual life? When you're thinking you're doing so great, you might not be. But I can tell you, the one who holds the keys to the future great, according to Ephesians 2, 10 through 2, 12. You are a masterpiece who was developed by the God who loves you to create and be creative and change the world. But you can't do that until you know Him as Lord and Savior. I want to talk to you just for a moment about how to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's as easy as ABC. That's how I remember it. It's, it's accepting Him for, for who He is, the Savior of your life, the Lord of your life. It's B, to believe that He came and died on a cross to save me from my sins, and C is to commit for the rest of my life, I'm going to commit myself, everything that I am, to the Lord in ministry to Him and to others. So as we close in prayer, I want to help you pray that prayer if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you're a believer, then this prayer is to just help to strengthen your, not only your prayer life, but your life with Christ. So bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the words out of this passage. I thank you for the storyline that we can learn from these women who were so strong and courageous to go and look into the things that nobody else wanted to look into. To discover that God had suddenly become present on earth like they had never seen before. Lord, I pray for that soldier. I pray for that family member who is now seeking to bring you into their life, to become one with you. So Lord, we ask you to forgive, forgive us of our sins. Come in. We, we, we honor your word. We accept you as Lord of our life. We believe your scriptures that you say you are you are who you say you are, and that we're willing to commit our life to you from now on. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.